an exciting find, but also a very educational and research-oriented research find. And uh, this is something that really describes what Oregon State is about. We not only uh, engage in discovery, but we research and we learn from it. So today I have with me Mark Massari. Mark is the Deputy Athletic Director uh, for Oregon State University and manages, among other things, capital projects. Lauren Davis, uh, Associate Professor in the College of Liberal Arts uh, and Department of Anthropology and an archaeologist of note at Oregon State University and on the West Coast. And J.D. Lancaster. J.D. is a Ph.D. student in anthropology at Oregon State and is part of Lauren's team that will be doing research, uh, examination, and education associated with this find. What I'd like to do now before we open the floor to questions uh, over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes is invite Mark Massari to describe uh, what really transpired in the last two uh, days at Oregon State and on the field of Reeser uh, Stadium. Thanks, Steve. So yesterday was my birthday, um, and I thought it was going to be a, just a normal Tuesday, but I guess it wasn't. So, uh, so as we run the project, the, uh, the Valley Football Expansion and Renovation Project, which is the third project, um, our third expansion or project um, on that building, first one was 1988 and then we had a phase in 1994 to 96 and this is the third phase um, I'm not sure any of them been as exciting as this but uh, so as the as we discovered uh, I think it was late yesterday I'm sorry late Monday uh, we discovered um, through our project team Hunt Fortis is the contractor on the building uh, our, all of our projects in athletics are run just like the university where we run through a project team and that's headed up by Lori Fulton and Dave Raleigh both Tim Sissel with Hunt Fortis uh, Joint Venture is here and Dave Raleigh is here too. So um, they immediately went into action and I'll let them tell you about how the play-by-play the blow -by -play went there. Um, but they let us know that they discovered something. Um, they made sure that uh, they called in the, the, campus, uh, the campus people. Um, it stopped about a half a day, maybe a day of, of production. So we're back on production right now. Um, so as we went through that, Yesterday, uh, when the when they were working on the on the on the bones uh, in the in the project, our student athletes are actually eating up on the third floor of Valley Football Center, and some of the uh, some of the work was being pictured you know, photographed by our student athletes. So we felt that we should alert the campus to let them know from a publicity standpoint that something was going on, um, and that's how we did that. I text uh, Coach Anderson, Gary Anderson, who's here, who didn't believe any of this and thought it was a hoax. Um, so as he saw the pictures and saw the national media, uh, he went into, uh, he's here today. So he's, you still believe it? What do you think? All, all right, he's all in now. He, he believes in. So we've got some creative names on what that, his locker room, which where the discovery is, it was founded, uh, what that could be named now. So he'll take, uh, he'll take any of those, any of those uh, opinions. So Great. So let me provide a little context. Uh, this is not just a Corvallis story. It's not just a national story. It's really become an international story. And as Dr. Davis will explain, while the discovery of uh, bones of this age may be common to some extent or have occurred in the Willamette Valley in the past, you can imagine that, that none have ever occurred within a, a working football field. What we have seen over the last day uh, internationally is media coverage and public attention that really is beyond measure that Oregon State has experienced in the past. Over the last 24 hours, there have been 37, 37 million web impressions of this story and the discovery by Dr. Davis and the University of these bones. In 35 countries, <clears throat> media coverage has occurred and actually last night woke me up about 3.30 with a call from Britain. If any of you want to take that call at 3.30 tomorrow morning, I'll share that with you. <laughs> there have been 110,000 engagements where individuals not only have viewed those 37 millions uh, to date uh, impressions on, on video screens, but 110,000 people that have actually clicked onto the photos, clicked onto the video, and explored more deeply what's occurring at this university and within Research Stadium. So it's a big story. A unique story and we're very thankful that Dr. Davis uh, and his students are, are part of that. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Lauren Davis. 
Thank you very much. So uh, I was contacted um, with the um, mention that they had discovered some large bone down on the end zone complex. So I came over and took a look at it. Uh, this would have been on Monday afternoon. And um, working with the construction crew and the um, managing people from OSU, we did go down and look at the bone. And it was pretty clear right away this wasn't something that was just your average someone buried a cow you know, a long time ago. Whoops. And uh, so uh, what we could see right away, they had exposed an area about uh, roughly, you know, five feet by four feet. And it looked like there was a piece of a shoulder blade, a scapula, and then some uh, pieces also potentially of what would have been the radius uh, and ulna uh, and maybe a piece of a, fem or, or, sorry, a humerus. And so we knew right away that we probably had an animal that would have been the size of a mammoth. Uh, at least it was consistent with that kind of size. Now, there was still a, quite a bit of sediment yet to look through uh, on the edge of where they were expanding. And so I came back the next day bright and early and we uh, worked with the equipment operators and they very carefully exposed sediment at our direction um, to see if we could, one, find if there was more bone ex expanding into the sediments but two, I wanted to evaluate whether or not there were any artifacts in association with the bone. Um, and I can say after uh, a full day of looking very carefully with uh, myself and with JD, there are no artifacts in association with the bone at all. So this is purely a paleontological discovery in that way. So as we work to expose more of the bone, we saw uh, that it kind of goes a little bit about an eight by, by 10 foot area and we found some other bone pieces that were from the mammoth as well. So another piece of pelvis, uh, quite a few ribs are in there. What we didn't see were pieces of the head at all and up. So, and the spinal column seems to be absent. Uh, we found other bones of other animals as well. We found some of the foot assembly of a bison. And then we also found another bone that we're not entirely sure what it is, but it's not mammoth, it's not bison, but it's probably in the range of something like camel horse, elk size, and it would have been a long bone piece. So what does this all mean? Well, I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity, this uh, experience to be able to go down and see these bones in place, to learn a lot about the place in which we live. And the environment of the past was really quite diverse, as you can see. If you didn't know it, we had this menagerie of different animals, you know, lions and tigers and bears of all kinds of different types, and elephants and camels and horses. and the environment of the Willamette Valley was tremendously different than it is today, that's obvious, but um, by 10,000 years ago, these animals uh, go extinct. And this is a phenomenon that happens all over uh, the world, actually. And um, so, just by that knowledge, we can say that these bones will be 10,000 years or earlier. And we don't have a specific age to how old they are, but that's one of the things we would like to figure out. So we're gonna submit bone samples for radiocarbon dating and we'll be able to determine their age. And that will be tremendously exciting, I think, to know this. Um, what we also could observe is that the bones appear to be concentrated within a darker deposit that sort of, when you saw it all cleaned off, it looked sort of like a, uh, a bowl shape. And it was much darker and then would sort of rise up on the edges. So what this likely is is something like a bog or a wetland that once stood on the end zone complex area in the past and it could be a natural accumulation of animal remains. Animals are attracted to places like this when they're sick or thirsty or, so something, we don't really know what happened to them, what their demise was, that's not clear from what we could see here, but um, what we do know is that it was a great place for these bones to, one, accumulate, but also preserve. Um, so, of a larger uh, relevance to this is, I'm attracted to working at places like this because of the research I pursue at Oregon State University. When you find animals of this size, you know that you're going to be in deposits that are at least 10,000 years old. So it attracts me to look at these sediments in case there are archeological remains with them. Because my big interest is a search for evidence of the people, of the, the earliest peoples of the new world. And so one of the ways to narrow this down in this giant landscape of ours in the state is to figure out where is the dirt of the right age and by finding bones of this size, of this antiquity, we know at least we're getting in the right place. But as I can say, 
or as I said before, there's no evidence of archaeology associated with this at all. Thank you, Dr. Davis. And J.D., from a perspective of a graduate student, and, and if you do work uh, with undergraduates, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, what this find means to you as a student and to other students attending Oregon State? Uh, yeah. So uh, I was involved with Dr. Lauren Davis in uh, evaluating the site to see whether there was uh, human remains or artifactual rem remains associated with the mammoth. Uh, this is a really wonderful opportunity. Uh, I got the phone call at 11.30 uh, the night before that we were going to be meeting at 7. So I was really excited. Uh, you know, I, I've been doing archaeology for 10 years now, and I, uh, I grew up in Central Oregon and was just surrounded by this my whole life. And so it was a really exciting opportunity for sure. Since I've been reading about, you know, excavations of mammoths, I've never actually been, seen one in person. So that was very exciting. Uh, it was really wonderful educational opportunity for me, um, although it was strenuous trying to get that thing uh, excavated out in time. But um, you know, I'm excited. Also, we have a lot of information that we can work with, and I'm excited to work with undergrads to try and help them to, um, you know, study these bones and get them back into a stabilized condition so we can, um, you know, preserve them and study them some more. So, thank you. So. We'll take questions now, and uh, after that, uh, Dr. Davis and, and J.D. will uh, unveil uh, the bones that were discovered and describe them for, uh, for you. Uh, we'll do that after the question period. And uh, Mark, are we still able to uh, invite folks onto the, uh, uh, the field but not into the excavation area after that? Yes. Well, there are two things here. We'll, we'll let you go out here to the doors are open on the club level. You can get some shots out there. And then Steve Fink, are you here with your team? Where's Steve at? Steve Fink is our um, head PR person for athletics, and he'll escort us down to the field. Anybody wants to go, but you'll be on the construction, outside the construction area, but you'll be at field level. You'll see it through the fence. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, for sure. I suppose the jokes just write themselves, you know, with these kinds of things. It's a wonderful kind of uh, thing to find a uh, discovery like this, a mammoth, maybe a bison, you know, and then other animals right near the area where I work. Often I have to go very far away to find these things, but here it is uh, right in our backyard. And um, the fact that you would find it under something like the, you know, the end zone of a football stadium, that's extremely unusual, and I think that's probably why this is, you know, in part such a big story. It's a wonderful discovery, uh, and also it's in a great place. Right now, it's, a, it's been a, no more than a day um, at the most, um, but no, I, I mean, if there's any more bones found, we'll go through the same system we just went through. Uh, with Dr. Davis and, and our project team, but no, we're they're, uh, they're, they worked yesterday. They just kind of did their cadence a little bit different on what the areas of the building they worked on, um, and they're working today. So, answer is a day at the most. Mm -hmm. There will still be football, winning football. Other questions, Bennett. So in terms of what the environment was like and what it would have been like for people that were here in the past, so the structure of the valley wouldn't have been dramatically different other than we would have had some different position of the Willamette River, I imagine. Um, a lot of the, the plants that we would see would be different than today. It was a little cooler and drier uh, in the western part of North America at this time. And uh, we also would expect to find as I mentioned before, this menagerie of different animals would have been more abundant in our environment. So uh, just to expand on the list of what we've seen here, this is more than what we've seen, we've got uh, lions and tigers 
of different types have been discovered in Oregon. We've got camels, I mentioned this giant ground sloth has also been found. This individual is something like 9 to 12 to 15 feet long. Very large individuals. They found them in Kings Valley, for example, not very far from here. Uh, they have very large predatory birds, once called a teratorn. It's extremely huge. It would have been a terror of the skies. Uh, would have been around here. Uh, but of most importance, I guess I should mention, there is an extinct form of beaver that is actually found in the Willamette Valley, uh, or sorry, found in the Northwest. And uh, we were, of course, very hopeful that we would maybe find something like this. But this beaver is so large that when it sat up on its haunches, it would have been about six feet tall. So Benny Beaver may be related <laughs> to this animal. I don't know. There is a striking resemblance, but so it's a real thing maybe. Other questions? Hang on a second. So why don't you take the first part? So the question of are there any other bones in the area? Um, undoubtedly, there will be other bones in these similar kinds of deposits because these things will occur at the scale of landscapes. So it's a natural part of the geology of our area to in some places get preservation of this. In the area where we worked yesterday, we worked with the team to make sure to clear off any parts that are in their construction zone that they were working on yesterday. So there's nothing left in that area but I'm going to turn over in terms of future stuff. So we don't, do not anticipate uh, further excavation for the purpose of discovery of other bones uh, occurring at this time. If during the uh, continued work, if bones were found, we would go through the same process uh, of, of care uh, of, of the discovery, uh, their removal in an appropriate manner, and then Dr. Davis and his students would examine them um, more fully. Yes, sir. There's a mic coming your way. Yeah, my name's Eric Gustafson. I'm a curator of the Condon Museum of Geology at the University of Oregon. Uh, two questions. One is uh, you have a choice of two different proboscideans for identifying this. What evidence do you have that this is a mammoth and not a mastodon? So let me take the second question first and then let the doctor take the first. Literally, this has just happened. And our commitment as a land-grant university, as a, uh, a research university, would to treat those bones uh, and their, their future resting place uh, with care and with uh, pub public opportunity for uh, viewing, uh, examination, and learning. Uh, how we do that, quite frankly, we literally have not had the chance to even stop to uh, evaluate that, uh, whether it's a partnership with uh, universities such as your own, the Benin County Historical Society, the state of Oregon, uh, we will do uh, uh, our utmost to be fully uh, transparent and, and available so that these bones can be viewed and enjoyed and, and studied uh, appropriately uh, by other researchers and the public. So in terms of answering the question, about whether this is a mammoth or a mastodon is that a fragment of a mammoth tooth was actually discovered as well in the process. So that narrows things down pretty quickly. They're very different dentition, as you know. Other questions? Yes. When, the question was, when was the last time we found mammoth uh, remains in Oregon? You know, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly when that was, but uh, mammoth remains have been found uh, closest if we were to work from this area out. Kings Valley, they found mammoth remains in the 90s. Uh, let's see, in the Woodburn area, I do believe they have found pieces of mammoth bone probably in the last 10, 15 years. Beyond that, uh, I, I really don't know. I'm, I imagine you might be able to answer this question better. So. 
So there's opportunities to, to follow up with this afterwards. I'd have to look that up, actually. <laughs>